Black Box was written by an actual crow on the SCP Wiki. You can find it in the link in the description, and it is under a Creative Commons Sharealike Attribution 3.0 license. Three weeks. That's how long they told Clancy he had to stay in the box. They never told him why. They claimed it was classified. They also didn't tell him that time itself would be locked up in another room, separated from the box that now held this withering husk of a man. At first, his decay was physical. He hit his shin on the bench after what may have been 20 minutes or 20 days. Not on purpose, mind you, but because the box's singular light bulb had burnt out long ago. None of the staff had bothered to replace it, so he cradled his leg in the dark, feeling his pulse through the injury. The pulse confirmed that he was still a man, a living human being that was above this degradation, this exercise in meaninglessness. And for what might have been a couple of hours or a couple of years, his pulse kept him occupied. Eventually, the pain faded. And once again, Clancy was left with the nothing that slowly eroded his mind. So he began drumming on the walls. Tap. 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 Two knuckles wrapped against the cruel concrete. And when they felt like they were about to shatter, he switched to the next pair of knuckles. He didn't stop until his whole hand felt like it was made of glass and his skin was every shade of raw. A slot at the base of the door opened. A styrofoam food tray slid through. The man stuck his hand out, not for the food he wanted, but for the harsh white light that he needed. But the slot closed. The man felt for utensils in the dark. His fingers found what could have only been a plastic spoon. Its handle sitting in the nutrient mush. This was only food by technicality, but the alternative was to starve, to regress into the nothing surrounding him. So the man fed himself. It felt like mashed potatoes soaked in milk. It tasted, well, you know, he wished it had tasted bitter or sour or something, but it just tasted like nothing. Like his tongue was tricked into believing there was food in his mouth when it was actually empty. He dipped his finger into the mush just to make sure it was as real as the walls of the box, as real as the door and the floor and the ceiling and the command from his superiors that held him here. Another spoonful, another taste of unbearable nothing. Again. Again. The decay went on. The man didn't know when he slept or when he woke. No matter how hard he looked, the trays of mush seemed non-existent until his feet fell into them. Sometimes he didn't know himself, and he would run his hands along from his feet to his head, affirming that he was still there. That he was still human. He would touch his dry lips as he tried to say his name. Usually all he could do was mouth out the syllables, but even that was better than when he tried to deduce why he'd been ordered to trap himself in the box to figure out what crime against nature could warrant this? Sometimes he'd whistle a note or two. Sometimes he'd do a push-up before collapsing on the icy floor. And sometimes he'd wrap his hand around his wrist and think about the gap between his skeleton and his skin and how it was getting smaller and smaller. Sometimes this, sometimes that, but never enough to stop the decay. One day there was something new, a window, circular and pristine, was now part of the far side of the box's wall. The man could see Montgomery, he could see the cars on the road and the faces in the cars, and he could see the morning sun peeking out from behind the clouds. It was yellow and orange and so warm. He could feel the heat when he touched the glass. His eyes stung, his skin itched and peeled, he'd been staring for hours. This time he knew. He'd been staring at dawn and stopped in the blue and purple hours of twilight. Twelve hours, he thought to himself. I've been staring out the window for around twelve hours. He knew when he slept through the night, when he woke up in the morning, and when he put his open palm up to the glass, his fingers casted long shadows on him, like cell bars. And he knew that he had to escape. The first punch sent fire through his right hand. The second sent fire through his left. 
Red specks flew towards the box's floor, catching fleeting sunlight in their descent. Another hit. Another wave of pain staving off the ocean of nothing. Clancy's heart throbbed in his chest as he threw everything he knew was him into the window. Elbows, shoulders, legs, it was all him. Again and again. Clancy's bones in the window's glass cracked in tandem. In one final thrust, one manic shoulder bash of a restored man, the window chipped. It disappeared in an instant place taken by cold concrete. But before the man could feel his heart break, the box returned to darkness. The previous note will be disseminated to all D-Class. The objective of this is to indirectly inform D-Class personnel that disruption of our modus operandi will never benefit them. While other disciplinary methods, such as those described in this note, have been somewhat effective methods of curbing unproductive D-Class behavior, they ultimately rely on external motivation. In other words, D-Class live by the Foundation's values to avoid disciplinary measures. Consequently, they act undesirably when they believe that they are not monitored. The proposed method attempts to intrinsically motivate D-Class to avoid uncooperative behavior. In other words, they should follow desired D-class behavior even when unmonitored, because they will have internalized that rebellion will only cause them further harm. We will not need to police them if they police themselves. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed the video, hit the subscribe button and leave a comment as to whether or not you think that this is an appropriate way of keeping D-class in line, because I certainly don't. And of course, if you really enjoy the content, head on over to patreon.com forward slash D and pledge at any level like everybody here on the screen already has, including MC Cashmill, who has pledged at $50, and Sinjariki, who has pledged at $100. It's nice to know that I'm not alone out here, and I will see you all again on Tuesday.